Right, uh, John chapter 14. John chapter 14, verses... I'm going to start at verse number 1, and then we'll, verse 6 is our main verse tonight. But we've got two hard sayings of Jesus that we're going to look at. And they're going to take us a little bit of time to kind of mine through these. So, John chapter 14, verse number 1. If you're there, say amen. amen. All right. If not, there it is right there, all in red letters on the black screen. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there ye may be also. And whether I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. All right, this saying of Christ in verse number 6 specifically, uh, if we can keep verse 6 up on the screen, is again only hard for those who see other paths to God and who do not embrace or like the exclusiveness of the gospel message. Uh, first of all, what's important to consider here is these are the words of Christ. These are not my words. These are the words of Christ. And when people blame uh, the Christian of being exclusive, uh, all we're doing is quoting from our Master and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who Himself said. And there's really no way to look at verse 6 and parse it, massage it, nuance it, and say things like, well, that's just your take. I mean, this is a pretty straightforward passage of Scripture. I am. Jesus has a habit throughout the Gospels of saying, I am. Uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, and then he doubles down, but by me. I want you to take note, first of all, of the definite articles here in verse number 6. And then we're going to quickly uh, piggyback and talk about the other I am's in just a moment. Notice it says, I am the, the way, the truth, the life. Now, if you take all of the statements, all of the I am statements, now if we consider these three instead of just one, there's actually nine of them, but technically they like to say the seven I am's of Christ. But if we count these as three instead of just one, um, there are nine of them, okay? You've got Jesus calling himself the way. He calls himself the truth. He calls himself the life here. Uh, in John 11, when he's talking to Martha and Mary, he calls himself the resurrection. Uh, in John's gospel, he calls himself the, he calls himself the door. Uh, in Matthew and John's gospel, he calls himself the good shepherd. Uh, in John 6, he refers to himself as the bread of life. Uh, in John 15, he refers to himself as the true vine. And then uh, in other passages, specifically in Matthew, he says he's the light of the world. In each of those I am's, he is, it, it all is precipitated with a definite article. Now, the definite article appears both in the Greek and in the English. This is where we can say we've got double trouble here for anybody who's going to argue with Jesus' words here in John chapter 14, verse number 6. When you have harmony between the Greek manuscripts and the English text, this suggests there is no possibility of translating this comment as Jesus being one way, a truth, or just life. There's no way. The Greek doesn't allow for that, and the English doesn't allow for that. And as I said a mo moment ago, Jesus Christ doubles down on this very definite truth as He closes out verse 6 by stating, No man comes unto the Father but by Me. So He's telling you He is the way at the beginning of the verse, and He's telling you He is exclusively the way as He closes out the verse. Now, you see, folks, rarely does anyone object to the idea that those who believe in Christ will be saved. What offends many is the suggestion that only those who believe in Christ find salvation. 
I'll say that again. Rarely does anyone object to the idea that those who believe in Christ will be saved, because that sounds general. What offends people is the suggestion that only those who believe in Christ find salvation. Yet that is the clear teaching of the Bible. Uh, let me give you just a few verses as a primer here. Look at Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Everyone's familiar with these verses, but some may not be, so it might be good to just look at them very briefly. Acts chapter 4, verse number 12, and here we have one of the apostles preaching, and he says in verse 12, there, uh, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now, I don't know if you realize the exclusiveness of just that statement. Look what it says. It says, for there is none other name under heaven. That means here on earth. That means Buddha. That means anybody. I mean, the apostles are being very exclusive and consistent with the words of our Savior. Uh, look at, uh, if you will, to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. And look at verses 5 through 6. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verses 5 through 6. The Bible says this, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. In other words, he's the only, he's the, Jesus Christ is the bridge that bridges your relationship between the Father and yourself. There's no other bridge. There's no other way to get to him but through Jesus Christ. Notice itself in verse 6. Who gave Himself. These are all exclusive words. Who gave Himself a ransom for all to be testified in uh, due season, or in due time, excuse me. Uh, verse 7. Uh, whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. So all I can tell you is from the Old Testament to the New Testament, the Word of God is consistent. You're only getting salvation through the God of Israel, period. Amen. There's no other way around it. Now, just for fun, if we go back to John chapter 14, I want to consider Thomas's question in verse 5 that precipitated Christ's response in verse number 6, which, of course, is our verse in question tonight. Notice the question in verse 5, and sometimes we kind of go, we read over the question. And I want you to notice some interesting things here. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither. Whither meaning we don't know where you're going, okay, whither. We don't say that very often, but that's what it means. And then he says, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Really two questions in one. Can we agree with that? Two questions in one. Now, Thomas's question here, whether you read it this way or not, it assumes the normal pattern of human accomplishment. And you say, what do you mean by that? That is, we determine an end goal, and then we work accordingly to achieve it. That's the, what this question, this, these two questions are assuming. Notice again, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? In other words, if we did, then we'd work our way to do it. The assumption was flawed in that Thomas assumes that man is involved in knowing the way. Now, I want you to think about it. Jesus Christ did not tell his disciples, Jesus Christ did not tell the disciples they knew the destination, which was heaven. In fact, Jesus said he would come and get them. Verse 3 and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. So he says, his promise was, I'm coming to get you, all right? Um, Jesus said he would not come and get them. In fact, Jesus said he would come and get them, excuse me, and they know the way there. Now look at, catch that in verse 4. It says, and whither I go, you know. In other words, where I'm going, you know. But then notice this, and the way, you know. The way, you know. 
Now, you say, why is that important to kind of stress that? Because this makes abundantly clear that the means of one's salvation is not a process, but a person. You don't have to know the pattern. You have to know the way. Well, who is the way? Verse 6. See, this, this makes clear that salvation is not some process that ultimately you get saved. No, no. This makes clear that salvation is important in knowing the one who is the way. And that's important. That's why he says, and the way ye know, referring to all of them. In short, if you know the way, then you're on your way. If you know the way, then you're on your way. And folks, John chapter 14, verse number 6, is one of those verses that end up getting used in these debates between uh, Christians and atheists, or Christians and agnostics, or Christians and scientists, or pseudoscientists, uh, that try to somehow trip up the Christian into making them claim exclusiveness. The Christian doesn't have to make any claim of exclusiveness because the scriptures make that claim all by themselves. Again, all we're doing is repeating what our Savior, what the book is saying, and that makes the case for us, right? Think about, if you will, back to the message that was preached this morning or taught this morning by the uh, state senator. He said, if you think to Romans chapter 2, God has written the law in everybody's heart. Now, not every ounce and iota of the law, but enough for everyone to know the differences between right and wrong and the conscience excusing and accusing, right? That also means and suggests to me that there's enough of the law of God written on a person's heart that they know what you're dealing with when you read 14.6. They know what that verse means. Now, they're going to massage it. They're going to do their best to, uh, to nuance it and parse it. But it pricks them down deep because they realize that if that is a true statement, then everything they believe is flawed. Not just flawed, completely wrong. And so they have to upend everything and all of the effort that they've put into whatever belief they have is faulty and false. And folks, I don't know about you, I, this is probably a horrible illustration, but I'm going to give you the illustration. Um, I would hate, this is going to be horrible, but just get it. I would hate to get divorced and then have to marry again. You say, why? All the effort I've put into Rita. And all the effort she's put into me. I mean, there's a lot of work. And to say that it's all done now, and to then have to do that all again, this, I, I know, oh, I, yeah, yeah. I'm going to be single the rest of my life. I've told Robin that. She did, yes, exactly, yes. Don't go to school. But, um, but the problem is, you have to just think about that. When an atheist or an agnostic is faced with the reality of John chapter 14, verse 6, and other verses that are very exclusionistic, they realize that if that verse is true and means what it says, it says what it means, then all of their premises are faulty. And it's exhausting to have to say it's wrong, repent of it, put it under the blood, and build a brand new life. Now, it might be exhausting from an unsaved reprobate's perspective, but man, once you get a new heart and a new walk and a new shout in your step, it's great to grow in the Lord, and the building process is wonderful. But again, that's only understood with a new heart. Uh, the last verse we're going to deal with tonight, not the last in our series, but the last for tonight. This is going to take us a little bit of time here. So Matthew chapter 11, verse number 12. Matthew chapter 11, verse number 12. Uh, a little bit less obvious from John chapter 14, uh, but nevertheless a complicated verse. Matthew chapter 11, verse number 12, the Bible says this. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, 
and the violent take it by force. Hmm, what's that verse talking about? Now, what's important is for us to understand the context that this verse finds itself sandwiched in. Obviously, we've got at the beginning of chapter 11, John the Baptist in prison and sending his disciples to go find Christ and ask him a very important question. Hey, are you the guy we're looking for or not? Right? Paraphrasing ever so slightly. Are you the guy that we're supposed to look for or not? Look at verse 2. Now, when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John, uh, go and show John again those things which ye do hear, which ye do hear and see. And he goes on in verse five to say all the things that Jesus Christ has done. And blessed is he who shall, sh who, uh, whosoever shall not be offended in me. Now. I want you to see if you can catch the irony of this passage. In verse 12, Jesus says, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the moment that Jesus is saying this, the kingdom of heaven is suffering violence and the violent take it by force. Look up here. Who's in prison? Then I guess that's true. Because the violent are indeed attempting to take it by force. And if you keep reading throughout the Bible, you'll notice, in fact, I think um, uh, Mike made a good point this morning about Paul knowing the ins and outs of Roman law and making the appeals all the way up to the higher-ups in Rome about his citizenship. This tells me he knows a little bit about law. Amen? And so if you look throughout the Gospels, uh, and you read some of the uh, uh, accounts of what happened to the disciples, they all died ostensibly for their faith. Paul did. Where'd Paul end up in? A prison, John the Baptist, and ended up getting his head cut off, if we believe all the accounts, which there's no reason for us to disbelieve. We know ultimately John lost his head because it ended up in the charger to impress a, a, a lady, right? And so... This verse is genuinely a hard saying of Jesus. However, what we don't want to do is what others assume about the verse. People, when they read verse 12, assume that the violence or the violent are Christians here. No, no, no. That's not us here. We're not imprisoning ourselves, and we're not going after Jesus we're not trying to sell him for 30 pieces of silver. We're not trying to trip him up in his words of whether or not he knows the law. These are not the things we're doing. These are the things that the Pharisees did. These are the things that the scribes did. And this is what ultimately the Romans did when they all, all, not just the Romans, but all consented to the death of Christ. They basically killed the heir, and I'm getting ahead of myself ever so slightly. They basically killed the heir and say, all right, now we can get his kingdom. Yes. So I'm going to explain a few things here. And again, it's going to take a little time. Some of you are going to be familiar with what I'm talking about. Some of you are going to be like, what in the world is pastor talking about? But just give me a little time to fetter this out. Now, again, this verse is genuinely a hard saying of Jesus. It is hard in terms of its language, and it is hard in terms of its interpretation, unless, of course, we just compare Scripture with Scripture. But there is a biblical explanation, and I want you to listen to this very closely. If, you can, if there's nothing else you get tonight, if you get this first statement, you will be head and shoulders above most preachers and most Christians. Number one, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are not the same thing. Now, you'll notice that in some verses, Jesus will say the kingdom of heaven, and then in other verses, in another gospel perhaps, it'll say the kingdom of God. Now, here's what's interesting. If you don't read your Bible very carefully and notice little nuancy changes in how a verse is written, you'll miss the entire doctrinal import and place a doctrine where it shouldn't be. I mean, you'll be completely messed up. And so the first thing I want to say to you tonight is that the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are not the same thing. In other words, they're not interchangeable, as some folks would suggest. Many scholars believe that the two, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, 
are interchangeable, but when one studies the scriptural nuances, one will note that the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are not exactly the same things. Now, here's what's interesting. There are similarities. But just because we have similarities doesn't equal identical. Look up here. We have twins that are usually in the services on Sunday morning. They're referred to as identical twins. That's false. Now, we say that because that's just the modern colloquial way we do it. Oh, these are my identical twins. Trust me, they know the difference between each other. And mom, maybe dad, but definitely mom, knows the distinctions between the two. And even, yes, Martha. I'm going to define that for you. Watch this. All right. Now, now that I'm done with my soft shoe, um, what was I saying? Twins. So just because people look the same does not equal identical. All right? So the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven might look and read the same in certain instances in the Gospels, but that does not equal identical. And it's those nuances that'll mess somebody up. Number two, the kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom, while the kingdom of heaven is always a reference to a literal, physical, visible kingdom that often can and has been taken by force and violence. Are we listening? Let me give you an example. Go to Luke chapter 17. Luke 17. Luke 17, and look at verse 20 through 21. The Bible says this, uh, And when he was de uh, demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Uh-oh. So we can't see it like normal way? Oh. Neither shall they say, Lo, here or lo there. In other words, here's the kingdom or here's the kingdom. For behold, the kingdom of God is what? It's within me? Uh-oh. It's within me. Okay. Now think about that. that. Is that what Jesus said right there in Luke chapter 17? Okay. So let's go back to Matthew 11 and let's look at verse 12. And also, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence and the violent take it by force. Does that say kingdom of God? No. So this kingdom can be, or at least they attempt to do it, all right? But the kingdom of God is not meat and drink and those kinds of things that you enjoy physically. It's a spiritual kingdom that is entered in by regeneration via the Spirit of God and that resident, and then the Holy Spirit of God takes up residence within you. Okay? Now, the, the kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. Keep that in mind. It's not physical. The kingdom of heaven is always a reference to a literal, physical, visible kingdom that often can and has been taken by force and violence. Now, let me explain that to you. Keep your finger in Matthew 11. Go to Daniel 2. Daniel 2. And look at verses 44 through 45. Daniel chapter 2, verses 44 through 45. This is in reference to the interpretation of King Nebuchadnezzar's dream. So we're kind of jumping ahead here. And, of course, Bob's already dealt with the book of Daniel rather copiously in the past, so I won't belabor with many points here. Uh, but notice here in Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much 
as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, and the silver back to that idol, the great God hath made known to the king that shall come to, uh, what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof. So listen, there have been all kinds of conquests of countries, all kinds of conquests of land, and usually conquest is usually done by force. I mean, you know, bombs and bayonets, right? Now, from, now go back to Matthew 11. From the beginning of John the Baptist's ministry until the time of Christ's ministry here in, John, in, in Matthew 11, the violent attempted to take this kingdom of heaven by force. Now think about it. The scribes, the Pharisees, and Israel, and in, gen in general, all of humanity, successfully and prophetically killed the heir to the throne in order to get his kingdom. Now you say, where do you get that from? Look at Matthew 21, which is the opposite of Matthew chapter 12. <laughs> Matthew chapter 21, and look at uh, verses 38 and following. Matthew chapter 21, and this is an interesting parable. You might want to read the whole chapter on your own time. Matthew chapter 21, let's start at verse 38. Uh, let's start at verse number 33. Here another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and hedged it about and digged a winepress in it and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. Now remember, husbandmen here just means like farmers, people that are taking care of your property, your, your garden. And when the time of the fruit drew near, he, the guy who lent these husbandmen out, sent his servants to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. And the husbandmen took his servants and beat one and killed another and stoned another. I don't have time to get into all that. Again, he sent other servants more than the first and they did unto them likewise. This is a picture of the prophets and all them being sent to Israel and how they treated those prophets. This is the story, the parable that's going on here. Verse 37, but last of all, last of all, he sent unto them his son, saying, they will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. This is the heir apparent to this whole thing. This is the heir, come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his inheritance. And they caught him, cast him out of the vineyard, and slew him. When the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh, what will he do unto those husbandmen? Well, I just pray and hope I'm not one of those husbandmen, amen. Uh, but, but you say, what is that a parable of? It's a parable of what essentially they did, Israel did, to all the prophets that were sent to them, from the Old Testament all the way to John the Baptist, they slew them, they stoned them, they did whatever they, they didn't want, they did not want to hear the preaching of thus saith the Lord. So they killed them, because that's the best way to silence a preacher. Just kill them. Coming to a world very near to us soon. But, so when, so then God the Father in the parable, the picture here, says, you know, I'm going to send them my son. They won't kill the son. They'll reverence my son. Well, we know what they did with the son. They, did, they planned it all along, prophetically, but it was still planned. See, free will and sovereignty, all there, right? Planned, but they're still thinking about it, all right? So, what happens? They thought, well, we'll kill the heir, and then we'll snatch his kingdom. Look up here. The kingdom that they tried to snatch can't be snatched because it can't be grabbed. <laughs> It can't be. And the kingdom that they can see, if we go back to Matthew 13 about the, 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 the sower, the field is the world. God is the one that owns it now. He gave it to his son. He kicked out Satan and says, this is my, this is my boys. So guess what? They lost out on both kingdoms. The kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. So what happened? Jesus was offering the kingdom to the Jews. He was offering an earthly, visible kingdom to the Jews. At the same time, simultaneously, he was offering a spiritual one, which is interesting because it was happening at the same time. He's offering a physical, visible kingdom where, where Jesus would sit on the throne as King of kings and Lord of lords, and he was also offering a spiritual kingdom that could, 
could not be seen via observation. The Jews rejected both kingdoms. So what did Jesus do by the time you get to Acts chapter 10? He now sets one kingdom aside, the physical kingdom, the literal physical one where he's going to sit on the throne, and he is now offering Gentiles the kingdom that you are entered into by way of new birth. Now what's going to happen? At some point, he's going to snatch that away from the Gentiles, and it's going to go right back to the Jews. And he is going to then offer the same offer that he had initially, and they are going to receive it. Now, here's my point. The problem was they couldn't take the kingdom of God here in this parable because it's a spiritual kingdom that is entered via the new birth. It's a kingdom that cannot be seen with the naked eye, only the eye of faith. Now, one can take the kingdom of heaven by force, by violence and conquest. It's, hap it's happening all through history, even now. But you cannot take the kingdom of God by that same force and violence because the kingdom of God is only accessed by being born again. Now, how do I know that? Last verse, John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, right? Verse number 3. Uh, verse 2. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Why didn't he say kingdom of heaven? Because he didn't mean that. He meant kingdom of God. <laughs> he, he underscores that again in verse number 5. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. What's the point? That kingdom that he's talking about and offering to this Jewish rabbi is a spiritual kingdom that has only come by by way of regeneration where the Spirit of God enlightens you to your sin, you realize you're a sinner, and you come to Christ. Amen. That's how you get into that kingdom. But there's coming a day when he is going to sit on a throne. Technically, he's sitting on one now, but he's going to sit on one physically on the earth. It's physical in heaven, but there's going to be one on earth. And he's going to rule and reign uh, with a rod of iron, and his enemies are going to be his footstool. What's funny is they'll never be able to conquer that one. Never, ever, 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 ever. But they're trying to conquer everything down here thinking that they're snatching things from the air. Oh no, oh no. If you read the book of Psalms, specifically chapter 2 or Psalm 110, the father promised to his son, don't worry, I'm going to make your enemies your footstool. Don't worry. These little paupers down here with their little battle between Israel and this and this country and this country, those are just guys with little pop pistols. I'll take care of it. And he is. So who are taking the kingdom by force here in Matthew 11? Not you and I. We're the ones being taken by force. Or at least the apostles were in, in that immediate context. And in the most immediate context, it was John the Baptist, who the irony of is in the same chapter, he's in prison. So he was taken by force. Why? for daring to preach against the king's sin. Right? He preached against the king's sin. The king got all but hurt, put him in prison, wasn't really going to do anything with him in there except maybe let him rot, and then ultimately has to cut his head off to impress a dame. Right? And, and there it went right there. And folks... That is technically a hard verse if you're not on the right side of theology. That verse can... Listen, you look up that verse and put, a, put Matthew eleven twelve 12 commentary in your Google search. Holy moly. There are some interesting hoops that people try to jump through to explain that verse. Yes? Matthew. He is. They didn't. They didn't want to hear really either. Well, they wanted one more than the other, but they rejected the spiritual, only wanting the physical. A king. 
So much so that they were bummed out that he kept saying he's going to the cross and dying. Yeah. I mean, they were bummed out. Like, don't talk like that. <laughs> don't say you're going to die. So, all right. Whoa. All right. Must be the end of the concert. Sound system starting to go. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity tonight to look to your word. Father, we ask you to bless us with our separate ways. Thank you, Lord, for these verses. And Father, again, not me, but the clarity of your word, being able to clear them out. Uh, clear them up, Lord. In Jesus Christ's name, we ask it. Amen. Wednesday, we'll go right back through to 1 Peter chapter 2, even though we had a brief break with Dr. Paul last Wednesday. Take care.